everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our Skills Future Community Development Council webinar titled Adapting to Overcome Digitalization and Job Redesign for the FMB Sector. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon in our virtual webinar. This is a session organized by the National Center of Excellence for Workplace Learning, where I come from. My name is Aziza and CDC. This is in conjunction with Skills Future Month. This afternoon, you'll have the opportunity to hear from leading entrepreneurs in the FMB sector who are continuing to deal with the challenges brought forth by COVID-19 and what they've done to adapt their operations to quickly transform, leveraging on tools such as digitalization and job redesign, to name a few. They'll share with us their stories, the volatile, the uncertain, the unexpected, these conditions that were brought about by COVID-19 as well as what they're doing to mitigate and overcome some of these challenges. It is our hope that through this session, you will yourselves as, as individuals and as companies gain some insight into what you can do in your own struggles and challenges given these trying times. We would like to invite our first speaker, Mr. Benedict Liao. And Mr. Benedict, Benedict Liao is the co-founder and director of The Soup Spoon. He will speak on the topic, Be Lean, Nimble and Hungry for Change. Now, a bit more about Benedict. He's a co-founder and director of The Soup Spoon and leads in the digital transformation, performance strategy and human capital development at The Soup Spoon. He led the company to become an approved ATO or approved training organization and he won the WSQ Training Excellence Award, SME Food Category by SkillsFuture Singapore. So Spoon has also achieved the Singapore Quality Class for Innovation Excellence in 2015. Not easy feats. An advocate of continuous learning, Benedict believes that individuals today need to stay relevant by strengthening their digital skills, agile thinking, relationship building, and global skills. Besides being a coach at his workplace, he also serves as a mentor to undergraduates at Nanyang Business School. To share more, on how Soup Spoon has been coping amidst the recent challenges brought by COVID-19, let's welcome Benedict. Benedict, over to you, please. Hi, I'm Benedict, director of the Soup Spoon. And today I'd like to share with you some of the things that we have done to be lean and nimble, to sustain our business in a rapid changing environment. COVID-19 is indeed a painful global pandemic. It disrupts businesses, especially the more traditional ones, those that are not in the digital space. It has taken lives and also destroys livelihoods. We've seen many businesses cease operations and many lost their jobs. COVID-19 is more than just pain. It is utterly destructive. For the F&B industry, we've experienced no dining allowed during circuit breaker. This has affected many of us, especially those who are operating in CBDs, where many are no longer working in offices or working from home. For some of us, we may also have staff being stuck in their homeland, whether in China or Malaysia, and not being able to get back to Singapore. There will be job changes required to either find replacement staff or people who need to then double up their duties to take over people who are not in the company. So there will be job changes and establishments with extremely bad sales, uh, some have to call it a day and to cease operations altogether. Those who managed to cope typically had food delivery services and also have seen an increased demand through delivery platforms like Facebook, uh, no, GrabFoods, Deliveroo or Foodpanda. Those who were not part of it rushed to be included in the delivery platforms. Some also chose to have their own website and logistics and own delivery. And some uh, have to offer increase uh, their menu offering to increase sales. So responsiveness to change is critical. Recognizing that we are living in a VUCA environment where things can be volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. COVID-19 is the latest example of how such things can happen quickly in such an environment. 
So faced with great uncertainty, there would be fear and confusion. So thankfully, we have a very responsive government where we had four prominent budgets uh, close to, amounting close to 100 billion to support businesses, jobs, and calm nerves. But for how long can we rely on such grants and assistance? What can we do on our, ourselves? How can we be lean, nimble, and hungry for change to better deal in such VUCA environments? So yes, we ought to be lean, lean as in fit and healthy. But today, I am also referring to the philosophy of lean management. And there are three overview points I'd like to highlight. First will be customer first thinking, where we put the customer in the center of concern and design products, services, and experiences around them. Number two, people as a valuable resource because they are important for us. People that is able to perform in a level that is able to cope with the new challenges. And three, Kaizen, or continuous improvement. Always looking to improve things, be it incrementally small or when faced with a bigger disruption like today. So customer first thinking. We look first observe and understand our customers and design products and offering based on what they value. So things like this, design thinking is a critical skill. And for the soup spoon, our customers value time and convenience, and they focus on health, and they like healthy and quality foods. So that's our inspiration for creating the take-home soup packs, where our customers can purchase them from uh, convenience stores, supermarkets, and bring them home. This especially helped during the circuit breaker days, where many customers we would like the opportunity to have them conveniently stored in the fridge and when they need it, they just open up and they consume it. So we took the opportunity to improve our e-store and e-commerce offering. We have also designed several new ready-to-eat meals that are super convenient to heat up. And we have new flavor products and collaboration over time, offering customers to try out new varieties. We also took the opportunity to create new virtual brands to offer new menu items and offer it in delivery channels only. The good about virtual brands is that you can do it very quickly because there's no need for physical outlet setup. You leverage on your current space, like in a soup spoon, and we could actually come up with a brand quite fast with a menu item and offer it in the delivery platforms. So we have tried that and it worked pretty well, especially in recent case, right? we have Entojitos or Mexican and Chao Bella, which is Italian. People as a valuable resource. So over in Sootspoon, we want to build a culture of having good leadership and people with positive mindsets. So we focus on building up our leadership first so that in turn, they can also develop the people in their team. We wanted to have a learning organization environment where our staff can develop the skills necessary to proceed and add value with their jobs, both current and evolving ones. Some of the skill sets we want to focus on include the following. And these skills charts are taken from studies conducted by Oxford Economics and Towers Watsons, where they track percentage of respondents who deemed what skills are essential in the year 2021. Now you can see agile thinking is critical, especially the ability to consider and prepare for multiple scenarios. And this is helpful in volatile and uncertain environments. Next, highest would be innovation and also dealing with complexity and ambiguity. So having such skills is useful to see crisis as opportunity to improve. We all need innovation to sustain and thrive. Relationship building is another key skill to have, especially as we approach the machine learning or AI era. So we need people that can form friendships and networks that can have improved uh, co-creativity and, and many could be also in virtual teams moving forward, working together. And it's not just with machines, but also with people. Digital skills are no longer confined to the IT department or IT personnel. 
It is everyone's concern today. The ability to work virtually is no longer an option. It is a necessity, as seen in COVID-19 situation, where many of us have no choice but to stay at home, work from home, learn from home. We need people to be confident with digital tools and experience to build, to incorporate them into the business flow and workflow and processes. So having a working, a workplace learning environment is important. In the Soup Spoon, be it a Zoom or web conference learning or Google Classroom for the SOP or even individual learning platforms like LinkedIn Learning. We have supported learning at the workplace and have in the recent months put our people through several courses, for example, Skills Future for the Digital Workplace, Robotic Process Automation, how we collaborate in the modern workplace, and also how we do online marketing because it's so important to market, market our products electronically. We even look into performance coaching and that's important because leaders need to give feedback on how to improve uh, performance, how to gain certain competency or skills uh, with, the, with the team. So over here, we have a video that uh, I could also record myself. And that's actually what we do. We record our messages. We can also send it and upload it into our own uh, intranet or platform where we can uh, then uh, communicate to our staff and team better. And of course, those who are not present, they can, they can view the video and they could also uh, get the message. Kaizen, continuous improvement is a must, especially in the VUCA world, where change is inevitable. So let me also share how our company has experienced change since we started in 2002. So the first 10 years was good, but also challenging years. We had our first outlet at Raffles City back in 2002, and we had our second outlet at United Square. And shortly, we faced SARS, which was also a major problem back then, where we are located very near to Tan Tok Sek Hospital. Business were bad, and we eventually have to close the second outlet. And we have to review our strategy, reorganize ourselves, and we could only open the next second outlet a few years later. But thankfully, we learned from that, and we sustained and grew sizably to almost 20 outlets in Singapore by the, end, by the year 2012. Along the way, we created new brands like the Hamburger, Super of Asia, uh, the, the Soup Spoon Union, and had the opportunity to also have our first franchise in Jakarta back in 2010. Between 2009 and 2012, we had our first wave of digitalization then. We had our enhanced IT systems, at our outlets, incorporating table trackers, RFID system, ordering system, POS integration, and even an optimized workforce management system. So this proved useful as we scale for growth, focusing on systems and technology. We had about 17 or 18 outlets, yep, by then, 2012. And if also notice here, we also have a change in our logo sometime by then. The next four years, we had the opportunity to adopt high pressure processing or HPP technology to our, in our operations. So this technology enabled us to increase the shelf life of our soup products, typically from three weeks shelf life to four or five or even six months. Now this enabled us to do more with our products and extended our model to push out our take home soup packs to be offered in other channels like supermarkets, convenience stores, and even e-commerce, e-store, our own channels. During this period, we created new brands, strengthening the Soup Spoon Union with grills from the grill knife, salads from salad fork, etc. The HPP technology also made it easier for us to set up franchise outlets, which we have uh, later on. It so change is indeed Necessary and continuous improvement or Kaizen is key for it to be progressive. So we are now living in the era also known as Industry 4.0, where processes 
are increasingly digitalized and integrated. So machines could talk to machines through the Internet of Things. And there will be work implications of how we ought to respond or work with machines. Because there are some jobs that will be taken over by robots or automation through robot process or automation. And this was actually some of the things that we have done uh, during this period of time, 17 to 2020. We actually implemented the industry Internet of Things, uh, RPA. And more recently, we also worked on what we call the second wave of digitalization that also look into on, off, online to offline or O2O uh, things, where we are about to embark on a project integrating our online touch points, like our e-store to our outlets, and improving our customer data collection to gain better understanding of consumer spending and also uh, insights and how we can serve them better, how we can design our products better for them. We are also glad to be able to expand into Taiwan through a franchise and we now have about three outlets there and still growing. We also created new virtual brands to better serve our customers through delivery platforms, as mentioned, Entohitos and Chao Bella. And whether we like it or not, COVID-19 has created, has changed things. And now many have said, has created a new normal, which in turn further impact future of work and how we design jobs for our people. So let's look at some of the future of work trends post-COVID-19. And this was taken from a report by Gartner. And they have a nine trends that to, to, to talk about. But over here, I am showing the first four and to get some perspectives for the F&B industry. So number one, increase in remote working. We have seen many of us work from home. And so we will have, been, we will have more employees working from home, 48% projected post-COVID versus 30% before the pandemic. So how should we prepare our people having to rely more on remote working? Contingent worker expansion. We need to be prepared for replacing full-time employees with part-time or contingency, contingency workers as a cost-saving measure. So we've got to think about how we can better prepare and train up a pool of part-time workers and still treat them like our regular employees. Third, the role of an employer is now expanded and has now more stakes in the employee's financial, physical, and mental well-being. So how can we prepare our leaders to coach, mentor, and ensure the well-being of our employees? So since the circuit breaker, for us, we have uh, weekly Monday meetings, typically in the morning. Uh, we share updates uh, from the government and also updates from the company and also hear from the staff how they are coping at home, working from home. Right? If there are any concerns, we will be there as a support group. Uh, not just the leaders, but it's the whole HQ will be involved. And we have been doing that since Circuit Breaker and still doing so right now. We recognize the need to uh, be there and to have regular communication, especially when we could not see each other face to face. So lastly, separation of critical skills and roles. We need to focus on the right skills needed to drive the organizational competitive advantage and understand that digital transformation is inevitable. So for us, one of the things or the tool that worked well for us will be uh, the adoption of Microsoft Teams. Uh, we use it for our digital communication and work and we prepare our people for change and use tools like Microsoft Planner to organize and monitor work and also use video conferencing for meetings, whether we are at home or in the office. Yes, there is much to take note of. And to do well, we need to be nimble, to be agile. And there must be readiness to rethink strategy and prepare leaders for change. So we need to identify and develop the right competencies for current and future needs to stay ahead or even to sustain our business in such challenging times.
we ought to foster a learning culture and promote continuously learn, continuous learning at work. So we start off by strengthening the strength of our leaders and in turn, they could support our people in continuous learning. So indeed, job redesign and workplace learning is an ongoing affair. No doubt about it, we need to set the right environment and leaders must persevere to do so. So the question to you is, are you prepared for change? Do you also possess the hunger and desire for it? What will you be expecting moving forward from 2020 into the 20, 2005 or the near future? Remember, we can adopt the philosophy of lean, where we focus very much on the customer first thinking. We put our people first, internal customer, our staff as valuable resource to have the competitive edge, to have the right learning environment for our leaders and for our people so that they could continuously learn, for we need to continuously improve. And this is something that is a must. It's no longer something that is optional because things change very fast. And that's where we need to be nimble to constantly review strategy and have the right leadership structure, the right team for change. And therefore, job, find, job redesign and workplace learning is something that must be considered seriously by leaders because future of work caused by COVID-19 is severely impacted. That's all I have for today. I hope that will give you something to think about and also to incorporate maybe some of the practices in your own company and also to challenge ourselves to continuously learn to improve ourselves even better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Benedict, for such a valuable insight. A lot of insight into how Soup Spoon has managed to not just um, survive, but sustain and thrive in this whole years and years of change that has uh, overtaken us. They mentioned agile thinking, relationship building, digital skills, working virtually, performance coaching, and of course, a lot of it was on workplace learning and digitalization as well. So I think that was valuable insight for many of us to take home. Now, we're going to move to our next speaker. It's Ms. Melissa Ng. She's a co-founder of Project Asai. Her topic is on customer experience in the digital transformation of the F&B industry. Project Asai was established in 2015, and it's actually Singapore's first dedicated Asai cafe with a mission to show Singapore that making healthier choices does not have to be a sacrifice. I actually didn't know about Project Asai until my daughter brought it up, and it's true, it's nicer than ice cream. Melissa and her sister Deborah started Project Asai after leaving careers in law and journalism and being encouraged by their parents to start something of their own. In the five years since they started Project Asai, the brand has grown in its presence to four locations around Singapore, jump-starting the movement in the market today. Now, starting and running a business is one of the most challenging and chaotic experiences, but with an open mind, commitment, and recognition that it is a constant learning process, Melissa feels it's also one of the most rewarding. Here to share with us more on her journey of change, challenge, and adaptation, let's please welcome Melissa. Melissa? Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa, I'm from Project Asai, and today I'll be um, sharing with you guys our experience, um, Project Asai's experience during the circuit breaker in phase one, and I will be focusing on you know, customer experience um, in the F&B industry in the face of digital transformation and innovation. <clears throat> so just gonna share a bit about Project Asai. Um, we started early 2015, uh, we have four locations today, and we were the first in Singapore to really dedicate and focus our menu solely on the acai berry. And 
What we serve is that, so for those of you who are unaware, the acai berry comes from the Brazilian Amazon. It's high in antioxidants and various other nutritional benefits. We use a frozen base and we blend, uh, it's blended. So it doesn't travel as well as say some desserts do like ice cream. And I think when it came to delivery, we had to be very mindful of the consistency of um, our product. So I'm going to be covering basically briefly the challenges um, that most of us face in the F&B industry, how we adapt it, and then you know, what we can do um, to prep ourselves for the future. So a very brief timeline, I think we're all very familiar. Um, sometime in the end of, at the end of January 2020 this year, um, we got our first confirmed case of COVID-19 in Singapore. And by the middle of March, I think it was pretty clear that this wasn't anything like SARS. Um, it seemed like we were going to be in this for the longer haul. Um, and around that same time, I told myself, you know, this seems like we're going to be in it for the long haul. Um, and also, you saw a lot of major cities in the US starting to implement stay home orders, which means businesses were either encouraged, I mean, F&B businesses were either encouraged to only do takeaways or dining in were, were, were not permitted. And I think we were, in that sense, quite lucky because, because these major cities went before us, there is a lot to draw from um, when it came to our turn to do the circuit breaker. And I think F&B businesses had to adapt very quickly because most of us have large spaces. Large spaces mean higher rental and we all work with perishable products. So you cannot have product that's sitting in your kitchen, you know, not going out. Uh, but at the same time, if you don't, you have no income revenue. So I think because of um, these factors, it was very uh, important for many businesses to adapt fairly quickly. So we obviously had a very short time to prepare. Um, but yeah, I think those examples from the other cities helped us. Um, and I think many customers, once the circuit breaker was sort of announced, um, from our own experience, they were really concerned, like, how are we going to continue patronizing the brands that we want to? How are we going to continue to get the food that we're used to? Um, obviously, the most, I think, standout options for many customers, as well as F&B businesses, was food delivery platforms. And if you were, you know, already lucky enough to have it, in place, uh, an existing online ordering platform as well as in-house delivery. And I think that many businesses were already on online delivery platforms, um, the main few, some with their own. Um, and to their credit, I think a lot of food delivery platforms did cut down onboarding um, fees and also processing times. But I think the fact remains that um, the commission rates are too high. And um, I am somebody who believes that delivery is something that is, you know, aside to our main income generation, um, unless you have built your business model on delivery. And then, of, of course, we, many of us were also, uh, in, how do I say, limited by the delivery radius. And then once it came down to it, and, and these platforms started offering um, island-wide delivery, I think that the, a lot of the delivery fees were quite steep. So this is like a deterrent to me. If I don't live near you, I'm not going to, you know, I might not be as likely to patronize um, or order from you. <clears throat> and I think um, another online tool that was very useful during the circuit breaker was Auto. So I think Auto has been hailed as somewhat of like a hero for the F&B industry because they allow businesses to uh, implement an online ordering platform very quickly. And I think that it, it is very useful, especially for smaller, smaller F&B businesses um, and startups. But um, there was ultimately still, there is ultimately still a 10% um, fee on your order value. And you still have to kind of settle the logistics of delivery yourself. So you handle the, the, the delivery yourself. And so given all these considerations, and at the time uh, the circuit breaker was announced, Project Asai was already on um, one to two delivery platforms. But we looked at you know, all the existing options that we had as well as what other people were doing and we felt that what we really had to focus on was customer experience. Um, I think that when we were focused on survival, something that got sidelined a bit was customer experience. So my team and I sat down and we were like, you know, what can we do to translate customer experience into the online experience? 
in the first place, when people visit our stores, I don't think it's just for our food. Like the main attraction might be, but I think people also, um, you know, go to restaurants and cafes for so many other reasons. Some some are simple like location, cost, convenience. But on the other hand, you also have uh, you know regulars who just enjoy the service that they get simply because they're regular. The concept of your dining space, the ambiance, the interior, um, and we. You know, with that in mind, we just wanted to provide a customer experience where like, so many things in our daily life has to change because of the pandemic. But we wanted to kind of like hold on to the thought that food was one of the few comforts that we all had left um, you know, once COVID-19 happened and there was just so much uncertainty. <clears throat> so we decided to um, do a project as I curbside pickup, something like a drive through um, I think that there were other um, companies that also offer the option of like, hey, we'll you know, go and give you your food at your car. But we really wanted to centralize our messaging around this. Like, it wasn't just an option. We wanted it to be you know, a, a true highlight of um, what we could offer our customer. So this was the uh, poster that we used. Um, and so we wanted to prov provide a safe and hassle-free experience for our customers to come and order directly from us and pick up, um, pick up from our stores rather than you know, just on the delivery platforms. Um, and I think that since F&B was considered essential, uh, we could take comfort in the fact that while some people might you know, really be at home, I think there were still people who were going out to get food and we wanted to appeal to those people and stand out you know, from other people, I mean other businesses, um, to encourage people to come and buy from us. So we have uh, our Holland Village outlet is actually our flagship outlet and we have uh, empty parking lot space behind it and we decided to use that as our designated um, order pickup area. But um, rather than you know, just being inspired by the other examples that we saw in other cities, we wanted to make it a more customized and tailored experience for our customers, rather than just say, OK, this is the space that you know, we're going to be using. Uh, so what we did is we installed a tent, and we added fairy lights, and put a sort of like an event booth there, just so that you know, we could give the space permanence and definition and make it more welcoming for people who were making the effort to come down. So you can see here, I have how our parking space looked like before, both in the daytime and nighttime. I don't think it looks too bad, but obviously it's not a pickup area. And then on uh, the other side, the bigger photo, the bigger image is um, how it looked like after at night. So um, I think you can see sort of like a discernible difference. Um, and we wanted that to be the site that customers were greeted by when they, when they came and pick up their food. Um, obviously, there were like some cost considerations, especially during a time where like most businesses are saying, oh, look, I need to cut down on expenses. Um, but ultimately, we felt like customers would appreciate it. Um, once they come out, we wanted them to feel welcome. And I feel that sometimes, even though like customers might not recognize your effort directly, like, oh, this is what they have done, I think it makes a good overall impression. And I think it also encourages people who maybe are in the area, but typically don't purchase from us to come down and give, it a, give, give our food a try as well. And I think um, the response from our customers was very encouraging. So our, ultimately, our store sales made up up to 50% of our da daily sales total. So the rest was from um, online delivery. And I think given how quiet the, you know, the whole city, Singapore was during um, the circuit breaker, I think it was very encouraging for us. And I think that goes further in boosting the morale of um, our employees, our team members as well, rather than you know, just us rallying and say, oh, we can do it. I think customers are a big morale booster um, for, for your teams. Um, and I also think that because of the, the response and the effort that we took to create an experience, it makes the difference between like, okay, we're just going to write this out and see how long we can survive and hope that everything will be okay, versus like, look, if this is going to be our new normal, I think what we have here is something that can go the distance for us um, you know, as a company. And I think customers also really appreciate it because like, people who came by always say, it's like, oh, this is such a great idea. We love it so much. And we got very good feedback on Instagram. So I'm going to show you guys this video um, just of our customers tagging us on um, IG stories to just say like thank you and show their appreciation. And I think this was a very good form of um, like word of mouth. So you know, customers see like, hey, this is what's going on here. 
they post it on their social media accounts, which in turn generates more social media noise for us um, on Instagram and you know, encourage other people to do the same. So for us, ultimately, when deciding our online and offline approach, we wanted to find a balance. And I think that balance comes from focusing on the hyper-local, so, which means the local community around you. Um, usually, geographically, I think the fact that we had the confidence to implement our uh, curbside pickup was because we knew that we had people who could commute, whether by walking or public transportation, to come pick up food. And we also had um, a significant portion of customers who could drive by to pick it up and not even get out of their car. I think that was a very appealing thing for them. Um, and I think that no matter whether you are a restaurant or a business that only has one location versus many locations, um, you, you as a business owner would recognize the buying and purchasing patterns that vary, even if it's just a little bit across your locations. And in that sense, if you cater you know, to that immediate local community around you, I think you would be able to reach out to your customers uh, in, a, in a better way. So because we already you know, did the, the, the pickup, we really focused on what like free digital tools we could use. And the main tool that I'm going to be talking about is WhatsApp Business and Instagram. So for WhatsApp Business, I think many might be familiar. It works similar to WhatsApp. And I think the benefit is that all our customers, or most customers, people in Singapore, would be familiar with using WhatsApp. And it's great because for WhatsApp Business, you can set quick replies opening hours, uh, auto replies, and because of that, like someone will always be attending to your customer, and people are just familiar with using the platform. And then crucially, I think a lot of our staff in F&B companies, we train them for the job they were hired to do. So you know, when you implement a change, it's not going to be like everyone knows what to do overnight. So, but doing this makes it easy because you can do quick replies. And, I think as business owners or team leaders, when we ensure that we are there um, and implementing processes and systems that make it very foolproof or painless on our employees to pick up, I think that helps with the transition of what their job description looks like. So this is like how usually WhatsApp business um, looks like. Before the circuit breaker, we actually didn't use um, WhatsApp business, but in using it, I found it very helpful because you can even upload like your menu, your location. And um, because of quick replies, you can provide your customers all the information that they need. Some ordering platforms, that I mean, some ordering that I did, sometimes they don't tell you how to pay. Uh, or I think you can tell that there's no standard workflow. But implementing quick replies and a standard workflow allows your team members to you know, just focus on the job that they need to do, rather than like a helpline for customers who don't know how they, they can order. Um, and obviously, with all new processes, I don't think, I mean, I think we should remember that we have to be there for our team members and make sure you know, that you keep refining it, what can work better, what could we change. So for us, like our ordering process on day one and then towards the end of phase one look very different. Then the next is Instagram. So I think um, everyone knows social media is very important. Um, and I think COVID-19 has shown us all like, just how important social media is. I think that every f &B business or every business should have a base of content on Instagram or social media. Because like, even if you don't have a large following, when the time comes to it where you have to do targeted advertising or where your customers do have to turn to you know, looking for you on social media, um, you already have a whole host of content that is relatable, that speaks about your brand, and communicates your lifestyle messages. And I think it's, um, there's so many stories that many of our homegrown and local SMEs uh, in the F&B industry can tell. And being on Instagram also allowed us to communicate all our updates on our uh, ordering process very quickly to our customers. You, instead of just telling them like how or you know, putting it on, as information listed on a website, um, I think we were able to show them as well. Like This is how the pickup process looks like. This is the safety processes that we have thought of for you and how it's safe and seamless. And also, you can you know, spotlight your pickup process. Um, create experiences around your menu. It's just any angle that you think works for you that draws uh, more attention to your brand, you can do it on Instagram. 
So I'm going to show you um, how we show our customers how to pick up the drive through will work. This is actually an actual, um, an actual customer pickup. We didn't stage it or anything. So very quick, and I think very straightforward. And we obviously put, um, um, you know, graphic, I mean, images to show people how they could access the drive through And then for our walking customers, we didn't forget about them. We made sure that, you know, we also put details on it and um, gave them a tour as to, like, how we have changed our store setup so that, you know, they also feel safe coming down. And I think that um, even customers who still prefer delivery, when you see that these are the steps uh, that the F&B business that you're interested in is taking to protect their staff, to protect their customer, I think it gives a higher level of confidence, you know, because everyone is just like so unsure as to what is going on. Yeah, so this was what we showed. Um, and then finally, I think a brand website is also very crucial. Um, I, I know that some f and businesses like to use a Facebook page as their website, and I think that's fine too, but I'm always like an advocate of using corporate websites, an actual brand website, and using website builders, because with website builders, you can update your website very quickly. You don't have to rely on somebody or a team to do it for you. You can add pages, add information. And um, by also ensuring that you have a corporate website, I think you cover all bases, um, Facebook, Instagram, your corporate website. And by covering all your bases, I think you can reach as many of your customers across various demographics as much as possible, like you know, no matter what they use primarily. Um, it also helps with manpower and productivity, and I think this is a very crucial thing for all of us, um, you know, as our learning experience from um, the pandemic, I mean this pandemic, and from Circuit Breaker. Uh, I feel that when you put all your information on your corporate website, you just point everyone there, and it reduces the need for your customers to search for information, like I go on your Instagram, I search for this information, I go to Facebook and find some other information. You consolidate all your key information, um, on your website, and it also helps that your, your, whether it's your marketing or customer service team or your store staff can just lead everyone there so that everyone you know, can just focus on actually preparing orders, getting orders out without having to worry about the, the things that they are not familiar with, such as our ordering process. And we created dedicated pages for how our curbside pickup works and all the quick links for like how to start a WhatsApp uh, um, ordering process, payment QR codes, just to make it so comprehensive. Um, I think that encourages people to click and say, I'm going to order, rather than to say, like, oh, I don't really know how this works still. Uh, I think it, 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 it helps redu by reducing the number of steps that people have you know, to take towards making a decision. So I guess what I want to share is that you know, even as F&B businesses are forced to innovate and digitalize, we must remember that the customer experience should be the focus of everything we do. And I think there's so many ways that we can all do this. Um, for us, we're like quick service. So you know, some things we're a bit hindered by. Some and our, our food doesn't travel well. But if we curate family meals um, and then adapt our menu offerings to suit delivery, as well as, um, you know, focus on also driving our customers back to our stores because that's when we can remain the most profitable and stay afloat um, by offering store pickup exclusive. So something that's not available on delivery, thinking about packaging, and I think even basic things like labeling what goes with which item. I think I've seen a few instances where I'm very confused, like why I got so many sauces and so many dishes. Um, I think even things like that, thinking for our teams and training them how to label something like that really will go a long way in the very basic customer experience. Uh, as something fun, you know, you can create a Spotify playlist um, that goes with your meal. If you serve Korean food or Mexican food, I think that can be a really fun thing for your customers. Whether, you know, all of them um, use it or not, I'm sure there will be some that appreciate it. And it really, I think, goes the distance in speaking uh, the lifestyle brand messages that we want to communicate and, like, keep customers at top of mind. I mean, keep ourselves at top of customers' mind. And I think one um, very interesting thing that we or trend that we noticed during the circuit breaker was like people started sending food to each other as a gesture of like, hey, I'm thinking of you or I miss you because, you know, we couldn't meet each other. And even just creating like extended thank you cards or message cards, um, I think really adds value to the customer experience, both for like the sender and receiver. 
Um, and I think customers would really appreciate, you know, just that extra thought that the business puts in into making sure that that customer experience is, you know, a memorable, memorable one for everyone. So finally, um, I think in Singapore, food is very important to all of us. Um, it's something that we all sit, like meals are something we all sit down to and we bond over. And I think that if F&B businesses recognize that value of that customer experience and what food and community means to Singaporeans, and keep that in mind as we innovate and digitalize our businesses, um, I think like no matter what comes in the future, whatever the future throws at us, um, I'll, we'll be able to overcome together. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. So that's a lot of insight as well. Um, I was thinking about what you were sharing and uh, definitely uh, you went through some change and adaptation using digital tools. And what struck for me was that you said that you needed to train the people to learn and adapt quickly. And as leaders, we need to make it foolproof and frictionless for them. And this will help them to adapt better to the changes. So I think that's noteworthy that as leaders, we need to help our, lead, our, our team members learn. Thank you so much for that. Next, we're going to invite our third speaker. He is Mr. Daniel Tay. He is founder and executive director, PJ Group. And he'll speak on adaptation in PJ Group during the COVID-19 period. So Daniel is an unconventional social entrepreneur and he's a self-confessed gangster, he says, and is, um, a social, runs a social enterprise in the food and beverage industry. With the aim to build an inclusive society, he carries with him a never try, never know attitude, ensuring everyone is given a chance to gain employment and training opportunities. The PJ Group currently employs eight beneficiaries that make up 90% of its employees. Here, beneficiaries, we mean persons with intellectual and physical disabilities, mental health issues, um, sometimes hard of hearing, visually impaired, youth at risk, disadvantaged and the vulnerable. Daniel believes that by looking at their strengths and not their weaknesses, he integrated technology and equipment modification with his innovative and sustainable business model in mind. He created a dynamic work environment that aids all his employees. Daniel has proudly shared PJ's The Culture of Honor at a TED Talk at NTU in 2018. He also shared at Microsoft, OCBC, the Singapore International Foundation, the Ministry of Education, as well as the National Youth Council. Daniel was awarded the PAYM Meritorious Youth Award in 2018, while the PJ Group was awarded the President's Challenge Youth Social Enterprise in 2017. So here to share the key aspects of his journey as well as how the operations um, at PJ Group has adapted amidst the COVID-19, we welcome Daniel. Daniel, please, over to you. Hi, welcome. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. So uh, I'm the founder and executive director of PJ Group. So in PJ, we actually have uh, a few subsidiaries over the years since 2012. So uh, one of our anchors uh, brand is actually Pop Jai Thai, uh, casual dining restaurant. So how did we really start? I think uh, maybe just share with you about um, the context of our employment workforce. Uh, it is something that is um, untouchable. It's something that is very sensitive when I first started. So in one two, I asked myself, hey, uh, in order to, to use my own skills, which is in the f and how can I really um, support in this area and to, to, to meet different needs? So what happened is that um, I employed people who are special needs. I start to employ people who are special needs and, and to see that how actually we can have them with us creating employments and, and helping them to skill up. So with that, then uh, slowly we move on to uh, you know uh, PWDs, people with disabilities, and, and they are mainly people who are short, people that are amputated. We we employ them, we 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 create new roles for them. So in, in typically, they are not able to work in the FMB setting. But uh, with that, we I strongly believe that hey, look, we need to keep trying. We need to find ways. How can we uh, really 
we could provide some uh, meaningful and sustainable employment for them. So we, we actually created a, a customized uh, countertop a table and, and we train them to be our cashier using their strength. You know, some of them who can speak very well. So we put them to cashier in cashiering role. And, and for those who are not able to, to, to speak that well, maybe a language barrier, what we do is that we, we give them a, a more a practical approach. So what they do, they, they actually do the cuttings, they do the preparation work. So we design a customized chopping board to support them in this area. So it's, a, it's just a, a very pure uh, chopping board where there are templates. And, and those people who are, uh, 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 I would say, um, amputated or you're having some issues, we actually f cram it and allows them to cut. So that's what we do. Uh, and move on, we, we employ staff, the average youth, uh, well, every youth I'm easy to, to talk to. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I actually work with them, understand their different strength. And, and then they actually put into, into better use, you see? And, and they could do some areas that where uh, they, they, some of them do not have the confidence to do so. So we, we create uh, platforms to skill them up, uh, visual impact, uh, mental health, disadvantage, and even the vulnerables. So all this has made up 90% of the workforce, uh, not just in PJ Group, but also uh, making the first SME in Singapore to actually do so. Uh, it's something that many people have told me that, hey, it's not possible, Daniel, uh, having such a uh, marginalized and underprivileged workforce working for you. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be uh, sustainable. But guess what? We have been doing that for the past eight years. And with 10% able body, they are there to actually support us to bring it to the next level. So, um, maybe I'm going to talk a bit more about here. So, while we are I'm sharing about, you know, uh, the people I employ, but, but what do you really do, you know, by running a restaurant? Uh, so, what we do is we provide training. We provide lots and lots of lots of training for them uh, in every area. So, the, the first thing that they join the company, they, they don't have a skill set. They are people who have not been in the workforce. You know, so we get them there, we understand their, their, their weakness, we understand their strength, and then we help them in that specific area. For example, let me give you a case study. So uh, maybe I have a, a, a people with special needs who are not uh, been in a workforce for maybe 10 to, to 12 years. Right? We get them here, um, he actually cuts the vegetables, we actually recognize that hey, actually he, he's very good at repetitive work. So why not? We have him to do the, the cutting for us. So that's what uh, we do. Um, so we provide training and, and of course the employment. And the next thing, which is what I mean, skill set. So while he or she uh, train up to a certain level, we actually move them up to the next level. So we get them to, to train in like beverage making, how to make drinks, cooking, you know. So in our company, that's one thing we don't, even though we have a Thai restaurant, all right, uh, we don't have a Thai chef. All right, so who are the Thai chef? Okay, basically my chef are all the 90% workforce. They are the one who cook and prepare everything from scratch. Okay, so uh, that's how we, we train them. And of course, um, if you are talking about restaurant, a social enterprise, or you know, which is what doing good are about, right? We need to make sure one thing, which is much provide good and affordable food. And that is what we believe in, to create a sustainable model. And last thing is about transformation lives. You know, to see their lives are being transformed, okay, in, in every areas that they are doing. Okay, and we see that, hey, how a, a PWD, you know, move up to the next level. And they can be even be not just a staff, but they can also be a manager or a supervisor in their areas of respect. So, they are also the mentors to the peers. They actually will provide actually skill training for them. They train the fellow uh, employees, the fellow trainees, okay, to help them. So they are the one who actually coach. Yeah. So let me share with you more about this particular video. By tapping on the experience as a youth at risk and to really do something for the special needs, I created Hope Jai Thai. 
Hope Jai Thai was founded in 2012. We create employment and training opportunities for the beneficiaries and community in Singapore. With a 90% workforce, making it the first SME company in Singapore to do so. So we do not differentiate that they are they, we are we, you know, but how do we work together and be part of the society together? To allow them to integrate and adapt to the job, we have came up with multiple customized tools such as the topping board, the light bell system, and also the cashier counter that is lowered, suitable for the wheelchair bound. I have learned how to be responsible and work as a team. I always tell them that job is just an income. A vocation is something that you are willing to live for and to work for it. And that has created a culture in, it, in our company. Hi, my name is Daniel, founder and executive director of Hope Jai Thai. And that's right, you know, uh, in the last slide, actually in the video, you actually say, never try, never know. So, um, so what happened? So during COVID, we, as an FMB, uh, very, very typically, we, we face a lot of issues. Uh, one of the things that we face is, is actually something that we never imagined that that would happen in Singapore, which is a, a, a temporary closure, a circuit breaker that actually happened to us. So in doing that period, um, uh, at, the, at the very beginning stage, we, we are trying to find solutions. We're trying to find ways. How do we really uh, able to support you know, the business model? You know, we, we do not want these eight years of, of, of uh, our hard work or you know, our business model to actually uh, drain to go to waste. So guess what? Um, in 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 the in the beginning of the circuit breaker, you know, I think about one month before that, I actually start up a, a new brand. It's called PJ Produce. Uh, it's e-commerce, and and e-commerce is something that I'm not familiar with. You know, um, it's not something that I have learned about. So uh, I have to really learn everything, did all my research. But there's one thing in common that we are good at which is food sauce. So uh, we, we know how to you know, find the right supplier, getting the right supplies, where to get the vegetables from, the local food. And, and something that we believe in it is to support our local produce. So uh, we work all the dots together, bring in everything together. And then we put into our platforms, taking photo shoot, uh, put them into uh, digitalizations, uh, getting our employees to, to actually um, try out, provide the trainings. You know, and, and guess what? In the very first few weeks of our circuit breaker, we have lots of lots of orders, you know, to support in this area. And and it actually caught us by surprise. And and with that we face another challenge, which is uh, because we need drivers to actually sub, uh, deliver the food and also the, the products, uh, I think hey, why not can we create a fleet, a delivery fleet? So uh, I actually started a campaigning to, to look for drivers who are actually affected by COVID, you know, getting them a job, getting them an income, and even households who, who are struggling with some financial difficulties, we provide meals for them. So we actually uh, form a fleet, get them to deliver. So, so we don't just create jobs for them, we also feed their families. So, and that is what we do throughout the whole entire uh, circuit. Break. And even now, Okay, as even as we speak right now, we are still continue uh, all the work that we are doing. Yeah. So one thing is uh, connect with us. You know, get to know us more. Uh, you can through uh, our social media. Even our right now, we we want to go digital. So the next thing that we actually will do is um, we come up with this thing called a, a PJ Group Channel to to actually connect with with online audience. Yeah. So that's what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. That was very good sharing about how we can look at our people and we can think about what they're good at and we can put in ways and means to mentor and to coach them to be at their best, no matter where they start at. Yeah. So I think that was incredibly good sharing by, Dan by Daniel and the fact that uh, there's so much generosity from the company to actually train up people who are uh, slightly deficient in certain skills is admirable. 
So after hearing so much from our distinguished speakers, I'm confident that you feel yourself that um, there are ways that we can overcome challenges uh, brought about by COVID-19. So I'm going to focus my session next on ways to explore how do we help our human resources, how do we help our people deal with the changes? How do they adapt themselves? How do our company policies adapt so that we can be at our best and manage these challenges effectively. So we're all aware that training and learning plays a pivotal role in overcoming these challenges and I'm going to share with you the benefits of workplace learning in an era of disruption and change. First, I'd like to share a little bit about NACE. We're a collaboration between Skills Future Singapore and Nanyang Polytechnic, and we are led by Nanyang Polytechnic. We draw on the expertise of our partners, who are the Swiss Federation of Vocational Training, Education and Training, CIVET, the German Chamber of Industry and Commerce, which is IHK, and the Singaporean German Chamber of Industry and Commerce. We were inaugurated in July 2018 with the presence of Minister Ong Yi Kang. Yeah. So we want to talk about the changing nature of work. According to the book, The 100 Year Life by Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott, there is no such thing as a job for life. There's only going to be a life of different types of jobs. So they put together research that shows that projection of the future, a 15-year-old today would probably end up with perhaps 17 different jobs in five different sectors. So what does that tell us about learning? It tells us that there is going to be this constant need to change and constant need to reskill. So Benedict, in the first presentation, talked about the VUCA world. Certainly, we're living in that VUCA world today, uh, especially with the COVID-19 being in our presence now. So to deal with an increasingly VUCA world, we need to keep learning and we need to keep adapting. Right. So what happens when learning stops? Generally, when learning stops, there is definitely going to be a lowering of productivity in the company because the company will not be looking at ways to innovate. The people themselves, the human capital, without learning, without training, they don't have the necessary ingredients to know how, in what spaces and places do we want to innovate. We might see a potential talent leakage. We say that because many, many studies have shown that people move searching for growth and development. So if a company doesn't invest in its people development, your best talents might leave. And so we don't want to have that happen. There's also an erosion of knowledge and skills of continuous learning and good practices when there is a lack of learning, a lack of training. For the employee themselves, they might be unable to contribute to all the company's projections and the direction that they're taking, especially like digitalization. So a company that doesn't actually train up its people in digital tools, but is embarking on it, it may end up not actually reaching the desired state the company had envisioned, right? So a fixed mindset is another thing that can happen to employees that end up with a lack of training. They're not challenged to think differently, to expand and explore different ways of getting more efficient. Sometimes, without learning, we become obsolete in our skill set because we're not actually enriching ourselves with new skills. We're not looking at the external environment and seeing what we can um, add to our skill base. Yeah? And then, overall, we can become stagnant in our jobs. So that's not good. So certainly we want to be learning. But there is a challenge currently with the COVID-19 situation, obviously. Um, people are actually working from home. So when people are working from home, there's a challenge to companies. The companies have to have a unique way of keeping the operations uh, moving while reducing the impact of COVID-19, of the presence of employees at work. So there is a need to job redesign, perhaps, to alter, to reform, to rethink, to redefine job roles and skill sets. 
For the employees themselves, suddenly my job has been redesigned, reformed. So there's a strong need for some people to reskill. That means to embark on new skills, skills that they did not have and now they need to have for their new role. There's also a need to upskill for some other people whereby management and organizations may then want them to do a lot more than what they're currently doing. So again, it boils down to needing to learn. So then for us, basically, we want to be able to keep continuing to learn. However, there is a challenge. The sharing from our previous speakers is that there is a need to adapt quickly. There is a need to upskill and retrain. There is a need to do digitalization and think about new norms. But how do we achieve these actions amidst a crisis when companies face people shortage and financial challenges? So here, we'd like to talk about workplace learning. Workplace learning is about learning within the work process itself. A lot of studies have shown that the most valuable sources of learning happen to be from work itself. So there's a research by Mr. Lombarda and Eichinger that's proposed a model for learning, which is the 70-20-10 principle. Right? They postulate that 70% of what we need to know for us to perform well in our job, we learn from the workplace itself, so on the job. And then about 20%, we learn from our supervisors, our managers, our leaders, and even our peers, again, from the workplace itself. And only 10% comes from us attending training classes and classroom settings. That is because none of that work can be contextualized exactly to what we need at our own workplaces. So that, therefore, 90% of what we need to learn, we can learn at work with proper supervision, mentoring, and coaching. And this is a very powerful idea. What are the ways that we found people learning at work? Well, these are the ways. People learn by observing others. They learn by asking questions, receiving feedback, um, by actually trial and error, by solving problems together. So peer learning comes in. Um, sometimes they're doing their own research, so self-learning. So these are the ways that are available for people to learn at work. So then comes COVID-19. So how do we implement workplace learning if these are the ways in which people are learning at work? There is a new normal. There is social distancing. There is a need to be at home. And we still need to optimize our people. We still need to reskill, upskill, job redesign them. And they have to adapt and enrich their skills. Yeah? So what we found is that people are learning. People are learning in various ways. So as individuals, we can ourselves take on courses. So these are e-learning courses that are available um, and can help us attain qualifications. And as a company, employer, you can send your people to mm -hmm. attend training for qualifications. I think some of the companies that we've seen at the National Center of Excellence for Workplace Learning, they have shared with us that they're sending their people for uh, attaining qualifications. Another thing that individuals can do is they can attend online synchronized training. So we're now familiar with Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and uh, Google Meets. Why? Because we perhaps have attended training online, or we are engaged in team meetings online. So team meetings are also a great source of learning. So for us at NACE, we call ourselves NACE, the National Center of Excellence for Workplace Learning is NACE in short. We have turned a lot of our courses into virtual learning ourselves, so we're delivering our training. And as myself, I've had to adapt my own skills in order to do things differently. So it's exciting, it's fun, and it's possible to keep learning. The three speakers talked a lot about coaching and mentoring, the need to actually train up your people. So certainly, we do need to do that. And with social distancing and COVID, can we do that? Yes, we can do it with virtual coaching. We can use digital tools. We can have coaching for one-to-one -one or one-to-many using digital tools. Hence, we need to up-level our skills in coaching in order to use that technology to coach effectively. And NACE can help with some of that because we do want to train our people up, our leaders up, to be coaching effectively. And of course, we can still use those digital tools for peer learning, for peer sharing, 
for codifying information and sharing across the organization. So these are ways in which we are seeing workplace learning take, take shape in a COVID era. And you know, it is great that this can be happening in the companies. So, but we do need to think about the future. We do need to prepare the ground for workplace learning post-COVID because workplace learning helps with change. And we need to think about how are we going to build this culture of workplace learning. So how can we support our people in learning at work? We look at a 2020 workplace learning report from LinkedIn. They surveyed thousands of companies, thousands of people, thousands of leaders and employees. And what they came up with was a set of recommendations for how we can build a culture of workplace learning. So one of the things that we do is we can onboard people, okay? make learning a priority from day one. So when we have a proper structured training for people when they, when they join us and they start to perform, that allows for workplace learning to be uh, an effective tool to engage, to, to motivate an employee, to let them perform at an optimum level. Executive sponsorship, that's uh, another way of saying leadership support. So if, if we have leaders that can be learning leaders, learning champions, that's another fantastic way to build workplace learning. Managers can be a very good conduit for promoting workplace learning. So if a manager knows their team members well, they will have the best knowledge to curate and personalize learning for their teams. So once they know the gaps, they can close the gaps with proper coaching, they can actually personalize that training. And for new managers coming in, if we can already equip them with people manager skills, with coaching skills, with mentoring skills, that would help foster that culture of workplace learning. Of course, most companies have performance reviews. So part of that process is to surface up the skills gap that are present in our people and to make plans. How do we then um, address those skills gaps with workplace learning? And last but not least, we want to be able to show our learners the value of learning by having them apply the learning and share their application. So these are the various ways in which workplace learning can become very much a culture building within the company. So how can NACE help companies? NACE can help companies through training and through consulting, and we do have experiential learning trips, and we also have events and outreach programs that help to build a culture and propagate workplace learning practices for companies. And the training programs that we have uh, fall into coaching, mentoring, on-the-job training, and training needs analysis. And interestingly, a lot of the features of what we teach dovetail and align very well with the report for how to build a workplace learning culture by LinkedIn. For example, when we coach, we're actually helping to personalize learning, we're actually helping to um, close skills gaps. For mentoring, we're actually nurturing mindsets to be learning leaders and to mold the next, gener the next uh, succession uh, levels to actually uh, en enhance their capacity. Uh, and do more. So it helps with succession planning, planning and uh, talent retention as well. On the job training, obviously, um, it helps with onboarding. It helps to make people learn from day one. It also helps us to codify our best practices. So once we have an on the job training, we then reckon with the toxic knowledge that our current com that our company practices, and then we find ways to tap into that knowledge, retain it for the current and future, and then it can be shared across the organization. Of course, it also st starts with training needs analysis. So with training needs al analysis, we can identify what are the right training and learning gaps that exist within our people. And we can think through about formal and informal channels of learning. Can they be coached? Can they be sent for training? Or can they be having other platforms to learn what they need to learn? Self-learning is a great platform for learning as well. So training needs analysis can actually capture what are the gaps. And we can provide recommendations of what to do about those gaps, what types of training programs are suitable for the people in your company. We also provide consulting services. 
So when we provide consulting services, we, we start with on-the-job training. We can actually do on-the-job blueprints. We are also able to do skills gap analysis for your company. We're also able to provide funding for these consulting services. So there is various types of funding and uh, we look forward to hearing from you so that we can share more about how we can provide some of these fundings for you to propagate workplace learning within your company. But one thing that is clear is that for a workplace learning culture to take root, we need committed manpower, committed management, and reliable systems and processes. So with these three in place, it would help to foster a better workplace learning culture and provide pathways and platforms for uh, lots of the positive practices of workplace learning to take root. Here I'd like to share with you one way in which we can help companies build a workplace learning culture. Towards the end of the year, NACE will be launching the National Workplace Learning Framework. With this framework, a company that is in, invested in workplace learning, interested in propagating workplace learning, can have guidelines as to how to go about implementing workplace learning and embedding a culture to, to uh, take root. So we look at the strategy for learning that your company has, the leadership practices that are present, what are the planning activities for learning. We look at how training needs can help support, identify the gaps and uh, come up with recommendations of how to skill up your people, relevant skills for your people. We look at the environment in which learning is occurring within the company. We look at implementation and processes. So what are the ways in which people are learning within your company? So with this in mind, it can help to create a system for workplace learning to, to happen. Right. So there are many benefits to workplace learning, as you can see, and it helps us to weather the storm of change. It helps us to equip our people with the skills needed to manage change and to adapt and to retain and to enhance their skills. So can we turn every employee into a learner? That would mean that workplace learning, we, what we can do is provide a roadmap, pathway and resources for skills development for your people. Workplace learning can also help focus your attention on competency development for not just the current but for the future as well. So training needs analysis could be one way in order to tap into your current and your future skills can build a culture of learning at work through the ways in which people support their team members through mentoring and coaching, which we spoke about. With OJT blueprints, we can have better knowledge management. We can have more consistency in our operations. And uh, we can increase employee engagement. If we were to think about their development and growth, there are platforms whereby we have to engage. They will feel a lot more motivated and engaged at work. With engagement, with employee engagement, we often find employee enhanced performance and of course that drives enhanced business performance. So there is a tie between engaging with your employee, helping them learn and grow, getting them to perform better and that ties into better performance at the company level. So all in all, workplace learning, when you embark on it, they are the building blocks to help all companies adapt learn, survive, thrive in today and through all the changes that are to come. So I hope that with this sharing, there is a, a quest in all of you to learn more about workplace learning. And we would love for you to contact us. To date, we've helped over 120 companies across multiple sectors implement effective workplace learning practices. So I hope that we, what we have shared is something that is of interest to you and of course um, something that piques your mind about making changes and introducing a culture of workplace learning within your company. So thank you so much. That brings me to the end of my session, but not the end of the session for the webinar today because we're very pleased to now invite our distinguished speakers to come forward and to share with us some of their thoughts after all of the sharing that each and every one of us has had.
Yeah? So thank you so much for joining us back. So thank you very much for all of your sharing and your insights about the changes that have happened in your company since COVID occurred and what you've done to um, tap into your human resources and uh, to your digital tools to adapt and to carry on with your businesses. So one of my first questions will be about learning. I think we all agree that learning is critical to meet the, the needs of the current uh, situation. But we also know there's a lot of work to do when we're dealing with all this change. So my question is, as leaders, what can we do to support our employees to uh, learn while at work and going through these changes? Perhaps I can um, ask Benedict to share first. Well, I guess it's about uh, showing interest, mm. care, you know, why the individual should learn. Mm. Uh, it's not just about the, for the company, but also for the personal development of things. And showing interest could also mean uh, spending time, you know, following up, checking on his or her progress, mm. whether she, uh, they, whether they are understanding how they are coping, uh, whether the challenges they are facing right now. Um, do not let them feel that they are alone. Well, mm. That is a very difficult thing to do mm. because we are always uh, constantly uh, engaged with so much to do in the company. You know, uh, how SMEs could be seen as firefighting uh, because we have uh, short of resources. But of course, uh, it is through this firefighting that sometimes, you know, uh, push people to rise to the occasion and to do more. So even when it comes to uh, learning, it's not just about uh, coursework, mm. but it's also about experiences and mm. how leaders could share their experiences with each other, checking on, in on each other, on the emotions, uh, that is also critical. Mm. As a leadership team, um, do you think through about how, uh, what are the ways in which uh, you need to coach your, your teams to, to realise what the, the change is going to mean for them in terms of their job role. I understand, uh, Melissa, you, you had this curbside uh, change, right? And then you talked about customer experience. And there's a lot of skill sets in customer experience. So I'm wondering, like, from their role, you mentioned that, you know, there's a need to, to help them to sort of, like, it, to make it as frictionless as possible when they are maybe behind the counter and this is their job and now they have to do something differently. So what were some ways you supported that change for them? Mm. Um, I think right from the beginning, um, company culture is quite important. So even when they came in like on the first day of work, mm. as long as you... Um, they understand the value of continuous learning, you know? Um, and, and because no, like people can rise through the ranks in a company. And I think the same goes for um, situations that you cannot anticipate. And once you have that culture in place of learning, um, when it came to it, it was very easy for them, for, for all of us to gather and say like, hey, this is what we're going to be doing now. Um, you might not be familiar with it, but um, we have, we created guides uh, basically that, you know, they can follow and um, um, reduces the opportunity for mistakes. And then I was like, um, at any time, if there's something that we can improve on, I always ask for their input. So I think having that level of support and providing um, that support and then also being there on site with them um, when you are doing the implementation, like you don't just put something in place and say, okay guys, this is how you do it. You know, and then you guys go and figure it out yourself. I think it's important to also be there and witness um, any changes actually happening and seeing like what can you do to improve this or how can I make this easier for you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much, Melissa. How about yourself, Daniel? Uh, I think for me it's about how do we really convey the message to the employees mm. about how, how can they apply. You know, the message is very, very... Um, um, simple is that uh, after they learn the, the, the thing is that how do they apply it in, in, in their work environment in, mm. in even in their own life skills as well yeah. so these are some things that uh, we need to help them to digest that mm. after they learn from, from the, the causes or, or, or some skill set they learn they need to know that so this is something that's very important because this thing is going to bring them up to the next level mm, as mm. mentioned so uh, I, I really think that you, know, you don't just stop at that particular moment. He still has to continue learning in, in different aspects. Mm. 
So we spoke a lot about uh, needing to provide feedback right, with rapid change. So how have you found the experience of like dealing with uh, rolling out a new process and then needing to quickly teach your, pe your staff, you know, uh, train your staff and help them understand this is how we do things, but it's not really very stable. It's still quite, quite um, you know, loose. Then they need to think on their feet and innovate. So how do you create that culture where they, they are able to adapt quickly? You know, that they have permission to sort of figure things out on their own. What are some things that you... you Maybe you I can that, share. Yeah. Maybe yes. for me, I can share. Yeah. So in, in my company, uh, we strongly believe in uh, these four words called never try, never know. Ah, you yeah. know, it, it's something that uh, we break down into simplicity. Uh, don't, some, a lot of things we don't think complex. Ah. So uh, doing it just like in COVID season, uh, there are so many changes every single day. You know, uh, so how can we, uh, you know, break through, adapt, uh, is keep trying, you know, keep mm -hmm. trying, uh, understand why, why do we need to go for that, and just, just keep on with that and keep the atmosphere, uh, keep the environment healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think we need to rara everyone up together. Yeah. And so, so in COVID, I see something oh. in my company is that mm -hmm. everybody is united. United. You know, every single one of them, you know, they're trying to find new ways to see that, hey, uh, how can we break through in the, for example, our delivery system. So, uh, we tried to use WhatsApp, for uh -huh. example. Okay. You know, using WhatsApp to do the ordering and, and, and that's something that I, 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 I really like about COVID. Oh. Okay, I'm very sorry to say, but I like about COVID is that because in, in normal days, we will never think that, hey, how can we improve? only when we are forced to. Mm. So in that particular period, uh, we learned that WhatsApp, we learned about both system, mm. we learned about uh, uh, using Facebook Messenger, mm. and, and even right now, there are so many other ways to do that, even QR code, yeah. right? So uh, these are things that we learned along the way. Yeah. yeah, That's interesting. One of the questions that came up was, yes, what are some uh, lessons that, you know, one, one or two very pivotal lessons that you have taken from this current COVID situation? I know that some, you, you shared the long journey, Benedict, from like 2002, right? When Sutsuko mm. started and then you went through SARS and, and all of that. But particularly with this COVID, it's so rapid. It, like you mentioned, it was discovered in January in Singapore and then all of a sudden by March, we were, we were already towards um, a situation where we needed to have a lockdown. So what lessons have you drawn from the, from the current episode and what you have done since then? Uh, it is about being prepared. Being prepared? Being prepared. Okay. So, you know, like um, Daniel said, you know, never try, never know, <laughs> right? And then, of course, you, if you try, things may, you may fail or things may need to be changed because yeah. the situation requires you to change, mm. you know, and, and being prepared and having an agile mindset. So mm, agile. I think it, it really is about the mindset of people. Mm. We have positive thinking, mm. right? And the leaders will play a very important role because if they are the ones that look uh, dejected and look defeated, you know, mm. then uh, they may not be able to rah-rah and to drive the people forward. Mm. But if you're prepared and people are together with you because they see the leaders are also doing it mm. yes, and uh, yeah. facing the change, right? And to, to do and do again. So I think that, that is something that a crisis situation like this mm. uh, often bring out the people, mm. uh, spirits, and then say, yeah, let, let's do it. You know, let's mm. uh, uh, do it together and defeat this situation. So it is about uh, a lot of it is mental. Yeah. Uh, even when it comes to using the tools, uh, it is not about, hey, the tools are difficult to use. Actually, it's not difficult. But also whether people are willing. So the willingness to be prepared to, to, to try things out and to prepare for change because we are living in a VUCA environment, yeah. right? This COVID situation is just one example. Mm. We do not think that this will be maybe the last, mm. right? Hopefully not so many of them, but it is something that we can draw lessons from it, which is to do, try, never say die. I think for as entrepreneurs, we, we have that, you know, we never say die. And we continue to persevere on. I see. So again, I hear that message and, you know, it's the people, it's actually the people that's at the core the people's ability to change their mindset, the people's ability to grasp the new uh, skills that they need to be uh, demonstrating and picking up. How about yourself, Melissa? What about you? What big lesson? I mean, for your case, it's quite a young company and wonderfully doing well, I hope. And uh, this is one of your, this is a pivotal moment as well for you. Um, yeah, I think I agree with everything. They're saying that um, 
you know, the leadership is important. Mm. Um, for us, as an, we, are, we are, I think, relatively younger than um, Soup Spoon and Jai Thai, but um, <clears throat> one thing that um, I've always focused on was teamwork, mm. as well as empowering my employees. So we are actually um, staff 100% um, in stores by female employees. Mm. Um, and that is a very important thing to me as a female co-founder together with my sister in the F&B industry. Mm. And I've always um, you know, focused on ensuring that my employees feel empowered enough to take on any leadership roles that they are given to them. Mm. Um, and I think in doing that, when the time came for it, when the change came and when we have to implement things, um, we are able then to fall back you know, on, what, on the work that we've done from day one, which is um, giving, having them have the confidence to do whatever comes our way, um, you know, building on top of all the things that um, Benedict was saying about leadership. When, when they have somebody to look up to and who believes in them, I think mm. even if it's challenging, I think they will rise to the occasion. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I've worked with some of you. Uh, NACE has actually engaged with some of you for uh, workplace learning. So in terms of um, coaching skills, where do you think uh, your team leaders, your people are at in terms of uh, having the, the skills to coach and mentor effectively at work? Maybe uh, Benedict? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Benedict. Yeah. Or You're looking for better. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So maybe for me to share. All right. Uh, so like for me, um, so in, in this COVID, I, I see one thing, is there are we, we are never perfect. There are always cracks. Uh. So so the one thing I learned is about you know, how can we collaborate? How can we have a partnership with with, with someone who, who can help us in certain areas? Mm. So uh, I actually uh, we, 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 we are very thankful that we know we work with NACE mm. so to, to, to explore in OJT footprints. Mm. To understand that uh, because in Popjai, in, mm. in Popjai PJ group, we have this thing called the, the, the service assessment, the kitchen assessments. I see. All right, and and uh, it's it's not good enough, I still think. You no, know, so how can we really this is the PJ standards, right? Yeah. But if I was to say my particular employees are being placed out in the marketplace, are they in the same standard? It may not. So that is why I think the OJT blueprints come in hand mm. to actually to, to equip them, to skill them mm. to a certain standard level of or maybe in the national level if there is, mm. you know, to bring them to a level that hey, if I were to go out right now, maybe I wanted to go to Soup Spoon or, or so whatever, you know, they have the same standard of quality that we are looking for. Mm. It's a common language. And, and that is something that is very important. And, and, and we, it, it actually is good for, for entrepreneurs as well. It's good for business as well. Yeah. Because they skill up, we don't have to be so headed to look for someone else. Mm -hmm. and, and that is all about. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's uh, something that we've heard from uh, other companies that we have engaged. It's the toxic knowledge of the company. That when people leave, they take it along with them. And if we don't codify it, if we don't put it inside a structured training platform and, and share it internally, it, it, it goes with the employee. So there's certainly a need to, to codify the toxic knowledge within the company. But after codifying it, there is a need to uh, level up people to coach those, uh, those things that we know for sure. This is the best practice. So do you find, um, uh, do you find uh, coaching a particular challenge for your team leaders? Do you think that they are at the operating at a, at a good level? And what are your plans to uh, level them up? Uh, there are challenges indeed. Uh, oh. Different people have different leadership style. That's true. Um, and some would actually prefer to teach rather than coach. Oh. Tell. Right, tell. <laughs> okay, I've been there, I've done that, this is how you do it, yes. you know, you're going to do it now. But uh, different people have different ways and different strengths. Yes. And so uh, we want to uh, emphasize or you know, encourage people to really look into oh, how the person is actually performing mm. and what are some of the gaps, mm. right? Uh, knowing that there could be some differences, mm. right? But of course, there are the objective and goal, what needs to be done, certain things are no compromise. Mm. But when it comes to certain things like SOP, mm. uh, that there's no compromise, right? That's but right. when it comes to certain uh, like uh, customer interaction, mm. how to delight customers and how to communicate to customers, you could actually make some uh, changes or tweak. Mm. You don't necessarily need to follow to the script. Right. Uh, but it is important for us to actually uh, encourage our leaders to, you know, uh, mm. to guide, mm. right? to, to be interested, right? yeah. to give feedback, but not necessarily to be telling uh, all the time. 
uh, the points on codifying is uh, important and it's also good today. Mm. You know, you could take videos. So you not necessarily must uh, write down uh, every step which mm. we used to. Uh, but of course, you know, if you could still do up, you know, whether it is a, a chart, steps or video, if yes. you can do more, sure. You know, but then we, a lot of us will also be very concerned, you know, what if this goes to someone else, someone outside, you know, mm. because you, things may leak. Right. Mm, so it is still true. important for the individual man to man uh, or woman to woman uh, guidance and teaching. Mm. Right. So maybe maybe there isn't so much video codification, mm. you know, uh, but maybe something more print. Mm. Yes, I thought that your sharing about uh, videoing yourself in communication and sharing it with your team is part of uh, coaching in a way because you're messaging them out and you have things that they need to learn. So I thought that was a very nice, interesting sharing. Do any of you from the sharings that you each had, did, did something strike you like, uh, yeah, I didn't think of that, you know, as uh, each of you were sharing? Could it, was there anything that you felt like, um, I learned that from Benedict or Daniel or Melissa? Maybe I ask Melissa, you're the youngest company, maybe <laughs> you heard about uh, the Soup Spoons journey. Was there something about um, Benedict sharing when it comes to equipping his staff? Um, I think, as Daniel said, like every day was different. So, you know, I think what I learned is that um, no matter how prepared you are, you won't be prepared enough. So, I think being able to think, yeah. you know, as, as the challenges come and equipping ourselves to have those skills to deal with those challenges. Mm. Probably, yeah. Yeah, so, so for me, so for me in my context, uh, in my company, I teach them these three things. It's called CPF. Not the CPF that we had, but uh, CPF as coach, perform, and follow up. Mm. So, so like, like what like Benetton has mentioned, um, we, they're, they're, I, I came to a point where, you know, if I were to share all my SOPs, all right, then it will leak out because these are things that we've built over the years. But it came to a point, say, I, so for me, it's, uh, what am I doing this for? It's for common good and then to have a sustainable business model. So, so with that, I actually came up with coach, perform, and follow up. Coach them, teaching them the right skills because not everything I can take from the book as a context. That, oh, you have to That's refer true. to this and then yeah. you can learn from this. Yes. For example, how about a, a poor customer experience? There's yes. nothing that you can coach them. You can just say, okay, we are sorry and hear them, right? But yeah. you need to calm the customers down. Mm. And it's not that easy. So that one, we can have to go through coach with mm. some experience in it. Mm. Uh, that is why uh, practice, mm. they have to keep practicing. If they don't mm. practice, they can't learn. Mm. Right? And the last thing is to follow up. Mm. All right? Follow up with them. You know what areas that they are not doing that well, mm. help them out, improve them. Mm. And, and that's what the difference between teaching and coaching. That's yeah. what I, I see. Yeah. Yeah, that brings up an interesting point. That's like uh, when you have skills gaps that's very evident, then you, you can have plans to coach and close the skills gap. But what about uh, mentoring? Like mentoring is when you're thinking about retaining top talent, succession planning, making sure that um, people are thinking more broadly about their, their uh, ability to lead big teams. So your company, you've had a long uh, runway. So do you have a mentoring program in Soup Spoon and, or something else that's called differently but it functions as a mentoring program as well? Um, no, we focus more on coaching. Ah, okay. uh, mentoring, you really look into a person's life, right? Mm. And then see what's best for the person. Mm. And, uh, it may or may not be with the company. Mm. But of course, yeah, you know, sometimes uh, outside of work, mm. uh, we, do, we do spend time and then uh, talk about things, mm. right? And to encourage the person to excel or perform mm. uh, in life, yeah. not just at work. Yeah. Uh, but we do also look into talent management. Mm where we identify who are our top people yes. and then we usually would uh, also uh, tell them right, what are some of the career developmental steps they may need to take or to improve on themselves mm. to then rise to the next challenge. Mm. Right? So uh, main purpose is to uh, yep, follow up and also inspire. Ah. Yeah, we, we need people to be motivated and not just think about their current role or current ah. job. Yeah. But, but it is something that uh, is challenging because you know, in F&B, yeah. Things change every day. There's so much uh, firefighting, right? And so, therefore, when you have time to breathe, sometimes you just want to rest. Mm. Uh, but, of course, uh, that's where learning 
also takes place when you are relaxed and playing. There'll be, and of course, uh, pre-COVID, uh, there are times where we want to get out and uh, have drinks together. Right? And that's when you have more relaxed session and you can give uh, informal exchanges. Yeah, but uh, with COVID, you could just uh, limit yourself to online drinking session, which, <laughs> which are, there are challenges, right? But of yeah. course, with phase two now, that's, we could still meet up with uh, some people. Yeah. Right, but we need to take notes of those uh, certain regulation of Team A, Team B. Yes, kind of thing, right? so, a, team B. So we are still looking forward to maybe when things are open up more to do more of these things. Right, yes. Uh, team A, Team B is, is for everyone as well. So I think there's one question here about uh, your own learning. So uh, in terms of where you are at, what would you like to learn in order to uh, Im improve your own um, selves? as leaders in your company? What would you yourselves like to learn to do better in order to um, perform better in, within, as entrepreneurs, as uh, business leaders in your company? So maybe this one I'll ask Daniel first. Okay, yes. <laughs> I was looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, uh, so for me, maybe I can share a bit more, a bit context yeah. in depth. Yes. So uh, uh, I, I didn't really have proper education. So uh. Uh, one thing about me is that, um, you know, why I, did I really set up an F&B? You know, it's because uh, in the past, I, when I was uh, uh, you know, creating a lot of troubles, right? <laughs> so, uh, Gangster. Right? Yeah, okay, so I actually yeah. went to fast food. And mm. fast food actually helps me to learn a lot of things inside. Okay. And that is where I gain interest. Uh, I hate schools. I, in fact, I don't go to schools at all. Yeah. But uh, I gain interest. So, so what do I learn? is that there are so many things that I, I can learn, you no know, business aspects, uh, how, how about HR, and even law. Okay, there are so many things that uh, even I myself, at this point of stage, yeah. I'm still learning. Mm. And I still need to upgrade myself. Uh, yeah. If I don't upgrade, uh, my company can't progress. Exactly the same. So I always tell uh, my team, is that we need to constantly learn. All right, uh, and, and that is where uh, we can grow. All right, uh, build your capacity. Yeah. Okay. Build your capacity, uh, expect the unexpected, you know. Uh, COVID, we, had, uh, we, we, we do see that uh, there will be a financial downturn coming up, but we don't see a COVID coming up. Okay. Right? True? So, so we, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. We don't want to be caught by a, a, a point that, you know, uh, we said, oh, because of this, then we go and do that. We, there's a one lesson that I learned that uh, we are sometimes not a good listener. Okay. <laughs> All right. Why? So can I can I just give one very uh, illustrator? So it's that QR codes. Yeah. All right. Uh, we never think that QR code can be effective because the era has ended somehow. Okay. All right. But in, in this COVID season, wow, elderly are using QR code. Every yeah. single one are using QR code. Yes. And that is something that, wow, mind blowing. Yeah. That it really true. works. The, yeah. the, so the key thing is we need to have the common purpose. We need to mm. find the same goal together and then we can achieve. So that's why I learned yeah, that, you know, uh, don't think that it's never, be, it cannot be done. It can be done. It's yeah. only if you believe it. Yeah. And, and so that's why you see elderly can learn. Now everyone is using it. And, and yeah. today I just learned about Trace Together. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a new thing. And I, learned, I just learned. You know, one of, one of the next members actually shared with me about Trace Together. Oh, Oh, that's how it works. It can make things easier for me as well. Uh, uh, yeah, that's so that's wonderful. how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, Daniel. Those things you just described, I don't think you need to learn at school. So you didn't miss much. I don't think at school they covered uh, how to deal with some, some of these types of challenges that um, come to us at our workplaces. Melissa, maybe I, I wanted to ask you, what have you learned about yourself through, when facing this journey? Because... This is not something that you could have anticipated and it's a young business. What have you learned about yourself? You know, I'm sure you were panic-stricken for a while or something like that. Um, what did I learn about myself? Um, I think probably that uh, I didn't panic as much as I expected to. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, maybe I learned that um, I have over the last five years grown to um, be able to look ahead rather than just what's in front of me. Yeah, okay. because I don't think, you know, any of us could have anticipated that. But when the time came, 
um, I think because in business you always face something unexpected you don't know what tomorrow or next month or next year holds um, and you know even when we're talking about like talent retention you can have a very good team today but you know um, people do move on in their careers and and sometimes the team that you have grown and developed might not be there you know yeah, down the road um, so I think just um, learning to expect the unexpected. That's yeah. right. Yes, you mentioned in your brief that uh, you were the first Asai, and after that you yeah. looked around and there were competitors already. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. that's another uh, lesson from workplaces. Mm -hmm. that you, you know, the, when you are good at something, yeah. then you have to keep uh, looking for the next yeah. um, way to okay. differentiate yourself. Yeah. Okay, so I think that um, it would be very interesting if all of our companies, having gone through what we've gone through, to have uh, learning circles to gather our employees to sit around and to talk about the valuable lessons that we have learned and to see how we can take those lessons and enact better strategies, processes and policies. Yeah. But of course, as leaders, we need to be leading in that, you know, in, in, in terms of um, encouraging people to think about what they're learning every day at work. And therein lies the message of uh, workplace learning. Uh, NACE was set up with a mandate to help companies build a culture of workplace learning. So it is heartening that you have come here to share what you yourselves have gone through and you have learned. And we hope to uh, further this uh, work with you and encourage those that are joining us today to think about workplace learning, think about what you can do in order to heighten workplace learning within your companies. Because in times of change, what we do and what we learn about what we've done is, is really key to how we're going to um, overcome these challenges. So thank you so much for the sharing mm -hmm. from our team. I'm going to close the panel, but not the session. So I would like to invite um, the speakers to uh, stand, and I wanted to give tokens of appreciation, if that's all right. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'd like to practice social distancing, so obviously here. Thank you so much. Uh, we've placed a plaque with Nace on it, so here you go. Um, Thank you so Thank much, you. Melissa. Thank you. So I'm sorry not to shake hands, but this is the new normal, right? Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much for joining us in this session. Uh, for the rest of everyone out there, thank you so much for joining us for the session. But before you leave, we would really appreciate if you could do an evaluation for us. And uh, this is in our slide, in the next slide. So before you leave, we'd really appreciate if you could scan the QR code and actually uh, provide us an evaluation. I hope that everyone who's watching has got some insights, has found some things that they want to do differently and are encouraged to propagate workplace learning within their companies. And as individuals, you're encouraged to keep learning, keep finding ways to learn at work and uh, further up your career skills. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.